Hello. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, let's get going with the third talk. We have here John. He's been here also last year and has given a very interesting and inspiring talk. Therefore, we are looking forward to hear him again. All right, thank you very much. I want to tell you a little a story about me growing up. When I grew up, I had two brothers. They weren't really my brothers, but they lived very close by. And on holidays, I'd go to their house, and we were very, very close. And the older brother was a very serious kid. Um, he liked rules. He probably would make a good Swiss or a good German. Yeah? Really liked rules. And, uh, and he liked being right. And he liked making sure that you know, everything was in order and very calm. And then he has a younger brother, and I'm also younger. And we don't like rules. And we don't like things being calm. And we particularly enjoyed torturing the older brother, whose name was Andy, as much as we could. And so uh, one day, he went. It was on a holiday or something. We were back. We were college age, so 21, 22, something like that. And um, he said, I'm going to go take a shower. And so I said, you know, I'll bet we could pick that lock to that shower, right? So we start picking the lock, get the door open. And we walk in, get a bucket of water. You know, it's really cold. And he hears us, and he's like, don't you do that. And we take the water, and we dump it over, and it's really cold, and we're laughing and giggling and all this stuff. And he says, don't do that again. And we did it again, of course. And he says, if you do that again, I'm going to run out there after you. And we said, there's no way he's going to do that, because just in the other room with the rest of the family, their kids, their grandparents, everybody was there. So, of course, we did it again. And he tears out of the shower, races down the hall, completely naked after us, past all the family, catches up with us, starts pummeling us, right? He's going crazy. And then the, the, the father comes in the room. What's going on here, right? What is going on? So we're laughing so hard. We're getting punched at the same time. Naked Andy is over there. And uh, we basically sits down, and the father's like, what's going on? What's going on? Finally, he says, and Andy just, you know, we get it all calmed down. He says, I don't care what you do to me. I'm not sorry, right? I'm not sorry that I ran out. And this is a story, and it's mildly amusing, and but we tell it every single year when we get together for Christmas or when the family gets together. And my guess is that everyone in this room has these stories from our families or our childhood or whatever that we tell every time we get together. If it's not your family, it's your friends. Um, and, and these things are important because <clears throat> I want to talk about how we can incorporate narrative or storytelling into the things that we design, whether it's products or processes or organizations. So if you look at design, this is the dictionary definition that Google comes up with, and it talks about it's a plan or a drawing produced to show the look and function, right? Or if it's the, the verb, decide upon the look and functioning of uh, making a detailed drawing of it, yeah? Um, and we, we kind of know what design means. And narrative, we know what this means too, right? A spoken or written account of connected events, a story. And actually, I would submit to you that design and narrative are very, very similar in that design is design it's designed to convey something, to solve a problem, communicate. And the same thing is true of narrative. So very briefly, who am I? My name's John. I'm the CEO of Administrate, which is software for training providers, right? I usually tell that to people, and they'll say, oh, so it's like educational, right? Instead, what I've done over the last few years is I switched, and I said, I'm the CEO of Administrate, and if you just picture for a second a training provider, right? This could be a training department administrator or a training company. And they've got all these students to manage, all these courses, all of these resources, room bookings, email reminders, things to send out, and so on. It's very, very cumbersome, very, very time consuming. Our software helps them manage that whole process. And then everybody goes, oh, right. And that's a very simple example of how injecting just a little bit of narrative even though it doesn't feel like it's a story, it is a story. We've just described our character, we've described their challenges, and we've described how we solve that into your designs or into your methods of communication <clears throat> can really make for a powerful impact. So why is this important, right? Why is this really important? Um, a very quick review. I talk a lot about product development, product design, and that's what I talked about last year. And I want to just remind everyone, products are really problem solvers. Right? So if we could solve whatever problem we had without writing software or without building something physical, we probably would. Right? Maybe it doesn't scale as well. But essentially, we're trying to solve problems with products. 
And these are sometimes cloaked with software or hardware, yeah? Um, and the best products are workflow driven and they're built by people that have a very, very deep understanding of their environment. And one of the ways to get a very, very deep understanding in the process of building a product and in communicating backwards and forwards with the user on a product is to use narrative. So I like to say that narrative or storytelling is very cheap and effective glue, okay? And it brings together these facets of products, designing, and understanding, and essentially narrative is really, really effective communication. So <clears throat> I wanna tell you a story about a time where uh, I grew up in China and we were traveling, we were going to Shaha, which is the second highest holy place for Tibetan Buddhists. I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but it's beautiful. We were driving, it's also out in the middle of nowhere, right? Uh, we were driving through the countryside and it was actually a busload of myself, uh, me and my classmates. We got pulled over by the police. And this is fairly typical in China, particularly in the, in the 90s. And they said, um, all right, everything looks in order, but where are your permits to be here? And we said, what are you talking about? What permits? They said, oh, every traveler in this region needs an insurance policy. And the only place to buy the insurance policy is at the police station. And the insurance policy costs, da 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 da, da right? So it's a shakedown, right? Okay, so get in the van. We drive down to the police station and we arrive and they said, oh, so you're a school, yeah. And Oh, do you, do, you, do you have a lot of computers in your school? Yeah, do you have do any of your students maybe know anything about computers? And uh, one of the teachers said, yeah, we've well, got this guy, John, right? He knows computers, it's me. And they said, well, we're having this problem with our printer, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, so come on, the teacher comes in, let's go out, get, get this fixed. Right, so it's all Chinese Windows, and I, I don't read Chinese very well, not the characters, and it was Windows 95, excuse me, Windows 95, which even at the time was very old. And so I'm navigating around Chinese Windows, and I managed to get the printer fixed, right? Before I do, you know, I'm saying, okay, this is what we're gonna need to do. He said, but what's going on with these insurance policies, right? He says, oh, you fixed the printer, no problem with the insurance policy, right? <laughs> so fix the printer, and on we go, right? And the benefits of this story, right, are that people tend to remember it and they say, a lot of times people say, hmm, China sounds like a very corrupt place, right? And I'll say, yeah, that's true, but people remember this story, so better attention, right, is a big advantage of storytelling. Another example that, that's true that happened when I was working at a mail order pharmacy uh, where we had software that was driving this big, long pharmacy supply chain, and it was like, I liked it think is kind of the world's most expensive, most complex model railroad. So big hoppers of pills on this end, and then the, the, the computer would say, all right, we got this prescription, these go down the line, the, the pills would go to the bottle, bottle gets capped, gets checked by a pharmacist, it gets packaged with other bottles for the same order, then it gets put into the right receptacle for UPS or, or postal mail, or whatever it was, and it was very, very complex, cost about 12, 14 million dollars. And I was out on the line, because um, the software that we wrote was driving this, and there was a pharmacist and he was checking. And we had this rule that when drugs came in from the warehouse or from the supplier, we'd say, don't ever double scan. Okay, so you pick a bottle out of the, the box and you scan it, it says we got one Lipitor, right? And then you scan it again, it says got another thing, right? We would always say, don't ever double scan, right? Don't ever pick up a bottle and you see, okay, this is a Lipitor and there's another Lipitor, scan that bottle twice, right? This is like our ironclad number one rule. And we would, we would train people about this. And one day I was out on the line and the pharmacist was picking up and he was checking it. And in the US legally, like most countries, he's on the hook, his license is on the hook if something happens. And every prescription that goes out the door had to be checked by a pharmacist. So he would, the tote would come, picks it up, checks it, puts it in, uh, checks it, checks it, right? And he's doing this. And one goes by and he says, he stops. It was kind of weird because you know, it's, the line's moving. He stops, he says, John, grab that tote for me, will you? So I went down, picked up the tote, pulled it back, and he pulled up two bottles and he handed me, he said, he said, do you see anything wrong with those? And I'm looking at him like, no, I mean, what, what am I looking for, whatever. He said, they're not the same drug, okay? And what had happened was when the shipment came in, somebody had double scanned, and they double scanned the bottle twice because they thought it was the same drug. The labels are very, very similar. This is actually a very common problem in the pharmaceutical industry, and they're trying to work to make sure that labels of, this, of different drugs look different, right? But he had seen this, and something had just bugged him, and he picked it up, and, we, and I said, well, what would have happened if that drug had gone out the door? And he said, well, it would have killed the patient. 
right? So they would have taken it and they would have died. And what happened was, so we, we prevented a mistake and really glad that that happened, but we used that then, incorporated that in our training. And instead of just saying, don't double scan, we told this story about how we almost killed a patient. And then that meant that people really remembered it and retained the information much, much better. You also get better attention when you're telling stories, all right? People like stories. They want to listen. Um, and they'll express or expose skills or conceptual gaps. So in that story of the pharmacy, um, if you didn't know anything about pharmacy, you, you might say, really, a pharmacist has to check every prescription before it goes out the door? We'd say, yeah, that's true. And what has happened is using the story as the vehicle rather than just doing X's and O's and Y's and Z's, and a very you know, literal black and white process, it exposes, because the, list, the listener is more engaged, a gap in their understanding. And people just love stories. And we know this is true, right? For all of time, most of our oral history or most of the history of the ancients was passed down orally. Um, these things in our families are passed down orally. We love stories. We love reading stories. We love creating stories and so on. And narrative, at the end of the day, quickly adds and conveys meaning. And narrative really transcends culture as well, which is important, right? So if you're operating in a bunch of different countries, our company operates on five continents, um, and mostly English speaking, but you need stories, you need, you need mechanisms and methods of communication that don't get held up with cultural issues. And I find that narrative really transcends culture. You get different reactions sometimes, but people will still listen and pay attention to your story. So another time I was driving uh, in the States, uh, in America this time, and I was going to a consulting gig. I had a consulting company, and uh, I still I had long hair, and believe it or not, you know, I had long hair and was not very clean cut, and uh, driving down, I was young. I got pulled over by a cop in North Carolina, and he said, do you know what speed you were going? And I said, no, right? It was pretty fast, though. And he says, uh, well, where are you going in such a hurry? I said, well, I got to get to this meeting. What, what do you do? Oh, I'm a consulting tech technical consultant. He says, you know, um, I got this problem with my computer, right? <laughs> it's, real, it's a real story, right? I said, he said, do you think you could help me with it? I said, well, do you think, what do you, what do you think's happened to this ticket? He said, well, just come on back to the car and give it a look, right? So I walk back, get in, and in the States, a lot of cops will have a computer that's on the passenger seat. And his problem was, was that the screensaver kept turning on, and he would want to look at it, right, while he was driving or whatever. So I went, disabled the screensaver, right? And uh, we shook hands, and that was that, right? And people love this, because it basically, you're showing that China and America are actually not that different after all. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I had a blog for a long time. And I, I made it a little bit more serious and everything when I became more professional, I guess. But um, people still say, I love that story on your blog, years and years later. And it's really interesting to me, because it's just a... It's a funny thing, but people really like stories and they transcend culture. So when to use narrative, right? I believe narrative can be worked into almost any situation. Product design, product onboarding. Um, it's pretty interesting that these days when you're onboarding uh, a new customer, maybe you're coming in on uh, a new free trial or something like that, right? A lot of the product design is actually now focused around onboarding new customers because we don't have big sales teams as much anymore if you're working on software as a service product, right? So the design process for onboarding customers is really, really important, and you can incorporate narrative very, very well. Um, product troubleshooting, uh, it's a very, very simple thing when somebody's submitting a bug report or something like that to just say, uh, or this, this doesn't look right, this doesn't work very well. Well, just craft a quick and simple story. So let me get this straight. You know, Tim goes to the store and this isn't working. No, 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 no. Tim would never go to the store, right? And all of a sudden, we're, we're getting information back that's better suited to help us design better products. Um, it can be your brand or your mascot. Uh, and, and this type of narrative, the more that you incorporate it within your products or your company or your culture, it, it, the better you will communicate and better you will get communication back from your, from your uh, customers. So a lot of times people say, well, this isn't, this isn't my job, right? Why is this my job? Um, and I like to just respond with something that we really believe at our company and something that I talked about last year, which I think the design is everyone's job. You can't outsource design, right? You can't sit there and you can't say, all right, we're gonna go through and blah, 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 and then throw it over the wall and the designer's gonna make it look pretty. No, design has gotta be 
a foundational thing. It transcends UI, it transcends uh, workflow, it trans transcends all these things. Design is really, really important and it's everyone's job. And I think the other thing that's everyone's job is communication. So communication, the best way to communicate that I've found is to tell stories and get people engaged. Um, and people will say, well, my product or my life or I work for a bank, right? I'm boring, right? Some people say that. And that's a valid point maybe. But I think you can come up with stories from everyday life, the more you think about it, with, with relative ease. I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, months ago, I was riding the train to go see a rock band uh, in Glasgow. So Edinburgh is about an hour away from Glasgow. Get on the train, got my Kindle, I'm reading, and I got on, they have an express, but there was some problem with that express, and it runs every 15 minutes. Um, so I got on the slower one. So instead of 45 minutes, it's 55 minutes, but it means it stops a lot along the way. And you get a different clientele on the local train than you do on the express, okay? Um, and it's not a bad thing or a good thing, but you're stopping all the time. There's people getting on and getting off. And I noticed that this kid that set, came on and sat down next to me, he starts coughing really loud in this almost cartoonish way. And I'm kind of, I kind of look up and I look at him and he looks back at me and we had one of these little staring contests and I was like, I'm not losing this staring contest to this kid. <laughs> right, so I stared at him and finally he broke the gaze or whatever and then he gets up and another kid joins him and the, the train's pulling to the station and they get off. And the ticket collector comes by and keeps walking down the train. And then the doors start to close and they jump back on, right? So they're dodging the fare, right? And this would probably never happen in Germany, yeah, or, uh, or in uh, Switzerland. But anyway, they're, they were doing this. And they are 16, 15, 16. And so I thought, I wonder where they're going to get off, right? So we make it all the way into Glasgow. And they get off. And there's ticket barriers there. And I got off. And they were doing this. So every stop, they'd kind of dodge the ticket collector and then jump back on. And we were walking up and out through the station, and it was kind of this narrow part where everybody funnels down to two ticket gates. And I look over, and there's that two bastards jumping the turnstile, right? And I'm like, I'm like, no, this will not stand, right? I'm going to fight for justice, right? <laughs> and so I'm walking out, and they come running by, and there's this like 17-year-old uh, ticket. She's monitoring the, the gates. She's, excuse me, excuse me, right? And they pay no attention to her, vault, start running. And I reach out, and I grab one of them, right? And then I was like, yes, I've done it. I've prevented, you know, a catastrophe. I'm, I'm a hero. And everybody's got to be a hero in some small way, right? And I look over, and the 16-year-old girl, the ticket monitor, is, has this look of total horror. Like, like, you know, yeah, she shouted at these kids, but they come through all the time. But now something's really kicked off. And this is going to be bad. And she's going to have to you know, spend hours and hours. And the police are going to come. And, every, and, the, and there's an American involved. And it's a, it's a mess, right? <laughs> And uh, so, so, I, so I let the kid go, right? And he's like squirm thrashing around. I let him go, and he runs off. And then we have like a nice civil confrontation in the uh, parking lot at, when, I, when I get out. And, you know, we curse each other, and we keep on walking. And I go to my show, right? And I'm at the show, and you, you drink a little bit of beer, right? And you got to run because the last, the last train back to Edinburgh is at midnight. So I'm running through, get the last train, and uh, get on the train, and the bathrooms are out of order, right? They're completely out of order on this train. So I'm sitting there for 45 minutes, just, just can't concentrate on anything but the fact I need to go to the bathroom, right? We pull into Edinburgh, and I'm thinking, I may not make it, right? It just, I just may not make it. And uh, so I get, get off the train, I run through, and in the UK, at least in train stations, you have to do a nominal fee to get into the bathroom, right? 20p, 20 pence. Um, I get up there, and all I had was a 50p, and I put it in the machine. It's got a turnstile, and it, it do, doesn't work. It just comes through. Exact change required. So I look around, and I jump the turnstile, right? <laughs> and I went in and used the bathroom, right? And this is a really mundane story, right? But at the end of the day, I became just like what I was trying to prevent. And this is a real thing that happened that I've told to people, and they enjoy it. And that's not a very interesting story when you actually think about it. But people will listen to me, and I'll tell it, and I'll enjoy it. And uh, you know, you can craft a story out of the most mundane areas of life, and it'll be good. But a little word of warning, yeah? Uh, using narrative requires responsibility. Um, you are going to shape whatever debate or agenda or whatever it is that you're trying to use your narrative to, to communicate with uh, quite powerfully. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the space pen. Has anybody ever heard of this? 
It's made by a company called Parker, yeah, and it comes in a couple of different varieties, but the most famous is the Space Pen Bullet, the silver bullet, right? And it's about that big, and you put it and put it, it's, it's nice. And the, the Space Pen is important because when they first started going up to space in the 60s, they needed something that could write upside down, and a ballpoint pen requires gravity to work. Um, and so the story is that they spent, NASA spent millions of dollars on this pen to develop. It's got a nit pressurized nitrogen canister. It can write underwater in oil. It can write for 30 miles in a, you know, in a line. And uh, it's this amazing pen. They spent millions of dollars, gave it to astronauts, took it up to space, and the Russians used a pencil, right? And this is a story that you hear all the time, right? This is a very famous story about this pen. But the problem is, is actually none of this story is true, okay? This story is like, you Google this and Wikipedia will come up, and it is not a true story. NASA didn't spend millions of dollars developing this. The Russians did take pencils, but so did US astronauts. And actually, it was so bad, because you don't want lead and little bits of broken off things and sharpenings floating around in your gear, and you also don't want you know, the fact that your oxygen reading was written in pencil to get smudged off or have ambiguity. And so the Russians actually bought the pen from a private company, and also NASA did as well, six bucks a pen, took it up to space, and everybody used it, okay? But because this narrative has been out there and this joke, we have now, it has become this thing where everybody's heard about the space pen, and almost everybody has heard about this joke. And it's not actually true. None of it is actually true. So, it requires a bit of responsibility. So, the challenge, therefore, is that incorporating narrative, you'll find, if you've got a strong narrative and the will to incorporate, um, it's actually pretty easy, right? You can change your documentation, you can change your products to, to illustrate things in, in, in a more narrative or, or using story in, a, in better ways, but crafting a relevant narrative can be hard. So I'll give you a few tips that I've, that I've learned, and this is not an exhaustive list, and there's actually some, some really interesting stuff done by an author named uh, Dan Pink, uh, talking about you know, storytelling and pitching is actually how he puts it, so just a very short pitch. So, but this is, these are some of the things that um, I, like to, I like to talk about. So first, first is juxtapose the unrelated, okay? Compare and contrast two seemingly unrelated things. So. One of the things that I like to speak on is how motorcycle racing compares with software development, right? These are two completely separate fields, um, and yet there's a lot we can learn by drawing parallels from motorcycle racing to software development. Another one that um, I'm starting to mull over quite a bit because I'm an avid cyclist, well, I try really hard, let's put it that way, uh, is the idea of what cycling has to do with running a startup software company, right? So these are very, very unrelated uh, ideas, but you can draw parallels and they'll stick in people's minds. Um, personalize the story, right? Put yourself in the story. Put others in the story. One of the techniques that we do at Administrate uh, is we'll talk about a client, right? This client's upset because they're John Peebles, right? I'm the CEO of Administrate, but their CEO, their John Peebles, will be acting like John always does, and he'll be demanding, and he'll be wanting stuff to hit deadlines, and, and that's why this client is upset or needs this urgently or so on, right? And just by injecting a little bit of narrative into that equation, it can really help understanding. You know, what are we trying to do here? Oh, their so-and-so is trying to work with, with, with our so-and-so and it's, it's causing a problem. And this can be a powerful thing. Um, incorporate the great, right? So find, read, learn about stories that involve famous people, kind of like the space pen, right? A fairly famous thing you can incorporate and people remember it, and there's all kinds of quotes out there, and it's really great reading and really entertaining, but you can incorporate these things into your documentation, into your design process, into the narrative that you're putting in front of your users. Um, the short story arc, right? Have a character, okay? Make them flawed, right? In the first story, I talked about Andy, and we made him flawed, right? We said he really likes rules, and he really likes order, and blah, 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 right? And that's, a, that's an important point, because otherwise it's not quite as funny when all, you know, all the chaos happens. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever played the video game Super Meat Boy. Has anybody ever played this? Um, that's a flawed character. It's a boy with no skin, right? And, and then what would it be like if you had a boy with no skin? Well, it means salt is bad for him, right? It gets on him and he dies. It means that he's very susceptible to all kinds of problems. And there's a video game that was made about this. And I think the interesting thing about that is 
you take a character, make them flawed, and all of a sudden it becomes very interesting. So then you explain their problem, right? And include some false starts. So first they tried this, and then they tried that, and then finally they tried our product, right? Or our design, or our thing. And this does a few things. It explains the thought process behind your design very, very quickly and easily and effectively. Um, but it also helps people understand where you're coming from. They may not agree with your choices, but at least they've been communicated. Um, and then lastly, inject absurdity for humor. So that's one of the things that's so amazing about Super Meat Boys. It's just an absurd thing. But you know, when you're when you're grappling with a challenge, it can be helpful to say, you know, you know, Mr. Bottle of Water over here is trying to, you know, he's in love with Mrs. Bottle of Water, and how are you know, just start taking absurd things, and you'll find that in these interactions, customers or staff or what have you will start laughing. You get these hilarious, absurd situations that you find yourselves in, and it it works. So. Um, one of the best storytellers uh, of all time is the company Pixar. So I don't know if how many people uh, watch their movies, but you can distill every Pixar film ever made and most great films ever made by, into this formula. Once upon a time, something. Every day, something. One day, something. Because of that, something. Because of that, something. Until finally, something, the end, right? It is amazing, okay? This is the formula. This is the most successful movie studio of all time, believe it or not. Billions and billions of dollars generated from this formula, okay? The more we can, we can recognize this and incorporate this, the more successful we're going to be. Um, so, cool story, bro, right? We've all heard stories that aren't very great, uh, including several of the ones that I've told today. Um, but, uh, you know, the key thing here is make sure you practice, all right? Um, this is really important, actually. Uh, I practice my stories all the time, mainly because I'm pretty arrogant and I like to be the center of attention. But I practice all the time. I practice these stories on my wife. I practice them on shopkeepers and taxi drivers, people I meet on the street. If I'm in a queue for the bus, I'll start telling a story, right? And it's important because... The more you tell a story, the more you figure out what the audience likes or didn't like, what well, went well, what didn't went, go so well. And it also breaks the ice really well. So I practice them on coworkers like, yeah, I already got it. You know, like or somebody already told me, you told me yesterday, whatever it is. Um, but it works really well in meetings too. If you walk into a meeting, hey, how's your day going? Well, I gotta tell you, the other day, right? I was going to Glasgow to see a show and then we start launching in right to the story about me and the two non-educated delinquents, which we call NEDs in Scotland. Um, and the, the key thing here is keep it short. Practice it. Figure out what works, what doesn't work. You'll notice people, it's very, very easy to do this at like a trade show, for example. If you're going and you're pitching a product or you're pitching a design or you're trying to figure out the best, fastest way to communicate this to an audience, having to do it about 150 times across three hours is really good. So practice. Make sure you practice. Um, sometimes people are sitting here and saying, well, that's great. You are obviously an extrovert. I am an introvert. And so you're kind of full of shit. And this whole thing is stupid. Um, I would just say most of us, even if we feel like we're introverts, most people tend to be ambiverts, which really means that we're kind of equally uncomfortable with the extremes and we're kind of equally comfortable. With the, in other words, we're kind of in the middle. We don't really like huge groups of people. We don't really like public speaking, but we'll tell you what happened you know, at the supermarket to two or three people, right? Um, but even if you are a classic introvert, okay, you are usually a much, much better observer. Some of the best authors are very introverted and they're great at observing things, which means you will have more chances to notice stories as they develop. And also, you remember the medium, don't let the medium get in, in the way. You can tell stories via email, you can tell stories through your product, through design, you can be very, very creative with this. Don't get scared off by this just because it may mean that you have to tell a story to a shopkeeper, all right? And also, culture does play into this a bit, right? Um, it is very easy to chat up or strike up a conversation with somebody in Scotland or any Celtic country, right? It's very difficult to do this in Denmark, for example, where, where I visited and I was like, hey, let me tell you about the other time. They're like, yes, thank you. You know, like, just don't, don't. It's just cultural, right? And same thing in Asia, right? But once you get somebody engaged, it can work. But you don't have to do all this practicing face-to-face, -face, in person, if that makes you feel uncomfortable. But you do need to practice, all right? 
And um, lastly, really make sure that you reiterate whatever point it is that you're trying to drive home with your story. So I think this was, I must have been eight or nine years old, right? And I was listening to a speaker my parents had taken me along to. And he got up there and he said, I want to tell you a story, right? There's this guy and he dies and he wakes up and he's like, am I in heaven? And the devil's there and he says, no, you're in hell, right? The guy goes, man, you know, and the devil says, yeah. He says, but before we get into, we're we're at the gates of hell. Before we get into hell, um, I always like to, you know, have a riddle or two. And if you can stump me with a question, then I'll let you go to heaven. We've got this agreement with God and everything will be sorted out. And so the guy goes, thinks about it a little bit. He goes, "Um, okay, um, I'll bet that you can't melt these three little things I have in my hand, right? Uh, You can't, you know, I'm going to hold my hand out. There's nothing you can do to get him to melt. The devil's like, this is too easy, right? He's he's got fire, brimstone, all these things at, at at the ready. And he scorches this guy's hand with the heat of a thousand suns, right? And it's still there. And he does everything he can. And finally he says, I give up. What, what are these things? And the guy says, oh, these are M&Ms. They melt in your mouth, not in your hand, right? <laughs> okay? Now, I remember this story from when I was like nine years old. It's a stupid story, but I remember this. And for the life of me, I cannot remember what this guy was talking about. I don't remember what his point was. I don't remember anything about it, okay? So make sure you reiterate your point. Otherwise, your story will survive, maybe even be twisted and taken out of context. You don't know. Make sure you reiterate the point. Um, And just a little bit of storytelling will go a long way. You'll find that just a little bit of addition to your product or your design that incorporates narrative will really go a long way. And, you know, we don't have to get out of control. Please don't go back and start designing in like, clippy into all of your products, right? That's kind of a bad uh, narrative uh, experience. But uh, a little bit will go a long way, and you should find that your communications and your products are much more clear and, uh, and so on. So um, that's all I have, but they wanted us to, to leave some, some questions. Um, but uh, feel free to email me or get in touch. Um, I've got to fly out, unfortunately, pretty soon, but I uh, really have enjoyed the time. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, this is my contact info. Uh, I guess now is the official Q&A time. Any questions? No, thank you. Um, I guess you have uh, several designers on your team. We we have we have one graphic designer or visual oh, okay. designer. Yeah, okay. but, um, but but I mean, if if this is important for everybody, how do you cultivate this uh, storytelling, this narrative in, inside your company? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think one of the, the the easiest way is that I just happen to believe this is important, right? So um, I kind of constantly need these stories because I think that. Um, Maybe this is unusual to me, but I really like literal situations. So when when we're designing a product, it is very hard for me to engage with this abstract idea. You know, this square talks to this circle. Talk, you know, then there's a triangle with the decision point, and then it's like, okay, that's really abstract. Let's just, you know, maybe it's just I'm not as smart as everybody that I work with, but I like to have a story. Okay, so Bob and we have personas that we've developed for for our uh, our customers, and sometimes we use our customers themselves. Bob is you know, needs this done. And then that starts the story process in many ways. Um, But I think, so if you don't have somebody that does this, I think just starting with the communication aspect and saying, you know, if a support ticket comes in, for example, that's an opportunity, just so I have this straight, right? You're trying to do this and that makes you sad and this is why or whatever. And you can start doing that and people say, yeah, you've got it. And that's a, you know, these are very simple you, know, you don't have to go back and redesign your whole product to include some mascot that's telling you stories at every you know, juncture, but you can just start the process of better communication using, using narrative. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. Other questions? Yes, no? Uh-oh. Who's, is that clear, huh? Um, um, maybe I can ask a question? Sure. So regarding product design, 
in which areas, well, along the whole iterative cycle, do you think that narratives can, uh, let's say, make a difference? Yeah, we like to sprinkle it pretty evenly on our product design. So um, the way it works, we're like probably most small companies. We got about 15 employees. We have a product team that's three developers, and then we've got myself as part of it. We've got a, uh, uh, our customer services manager as part of it. And then whoever happens to be working on the project, that our designer will also uh, participate. And we like to get, you know, last year I spoke on how to define problems and solve them. And we work a lot on the problem definition side to incorporate narrative, and, and that really helps clear up a lot of things. And then as you're working through the product development process, you can say, oh, don't you remember that? And, and you know, does, does the customer do this and so on? And it's, it's, it's using personas, it's using workflow and so on, and that's important. But then when you get to the end, these stories can be really, really powerful in documentation illustrating exactly what you're trying to do. So if you've got your cast of characters and they're going through, if you've ever played like a Nintendo game, they use stories right before each level sometimes to show you Mario trying to do something. And it's a very quick way of conveying to people who maybe can't even read, they're so young, how to play the game, if that makes sense. Thank you very much again for a very inspiring talk. Um, we have extra minutes uh, in the break, so maybe you can take the time uh, to ask uh, offline, John, several questions, yep. <laughs> maybe over a coffee. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>